Good morning. Grace and peace be with you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are so glad that you are here with us at Bethany United Methodist Church. Whether you're here in person with us, thank you for being here. Or whether you're online with us, thank you for being here. We are so appreciative that you take time to be in community as we worship together, um, God. And so I want us to continue in that fellowship. Thank you, Jeff, for ushering us into that time um, as we seek to be of harmony, to be in unity, to be one together and sound together. We all have different notes, right? But we all make this beautiful, harmonious sound together in Christ. And so I want to invite us to do that together. I'll, 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 we'll do a call to worship. We'll stand up and we will, uh, I'll say some words and we'll say some words together and invite us to do to this moment. We were glad when they said, let us go to the house of God. Our feet are standing within your gates, O holy city. We pray for the peace of all God's beloved cities. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of friend and stranger, we say, peace be within you, O Jerusalem. Peace be within you, O Durham, O North Carolina, O United States. Peace be within you, O world. Peace be within this community. For the sake of the house of the Holy One, we will seek your good. Let us worship the living God, tender and just. Let us sing. Let us pray together the opening prayer. God of promise and peace, you have called us to be covenantal people who commit to you and to one another to live according to your ways. You have also called us to be ambassadors of peace, representing and embodying your shalom in our private and public lives. Open our hearts today to hear your word and to sense your peaceful presence that stirs us to action. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
The epistle lesson this morning comes from the book of James, chapter 3, verses 2 through 12 and 17 through 18. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed upon our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. The word of God for all of God's people. Thanks be to God.
about church conference from Bishop Connie Shelton. Now, she's not here today. Our bishop is not. <laughs> but she has a little video for us. It's supposed to be played at church conference, but we thought it would be helpful to hear it here in church to kind of tell us about what church conference is and what we're called to do as the church in church conference and beyond. So hear this message from Bishop Shelton. All right, I'll see what I can do. Friends, <laughs> <laughs> members of the charge conference are to be persons of genuine Christian character who love the church. The fact that you are here evidences your love for Christ and the church. Why do we have Charge Conference? Charge Conference isn't for the bishop or your district superintendent or even for the annual conference. Charge Conference is for you, the local church. This annual gathering is a time for you to review and evaluate the total mission and ministry of your church through receiving reports, affirming discerning leadership offered by nominations, and adopting goals recommended by the church council for your future aligned with the United Methodist Church. Let's be honest, most times our churches are moving quickly from one thing to the next. If we didn't have the intentionality of charge conference, we may not pause to reflect deeply on the current reality of our churches. Charge conference is the perfect opportunity for you to consider why does our local church exist? The Church of Jesus Christ exists in and for the world. The local church is a strategic base from which Christians move into the world under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, helping people to accept and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and to live their daily lives in light of their relationship with God. Ultimately, the local church is to be in ministry alongside persons in the community where your church is located. The prophet Isaiah reminds us that God is doing a new thing. Do you recognize it? Let me be honest. The way I came to know and follow Jesus is not the same way my daughters who were in their 20s experienced Jesus and the church. They experience Jesus and the church through deep connections of authenticity with others seeking Jesus, but they strongly resist those seeking Jesus in a spirit of self-righteousness and moral superiority. Those of us who've been in the church for a while need to name where we are stuck. We may need to let go of nostalgia 
sentimentality, our preferences. We may need to let go of fear and grief that if we don't do church like our ancestors, our parents or grandparents or family, that somehow we're disrespecting them or dishonoring them. The surprising grace of God through Christ disrupts the status quo. God's love is not bound to our preferences, practices, or pet peeves. Don't misunderstand. We don't let go of the important foundations of our historic faith. We profess and confess in the Apostles' Creed, the triune God, the divinity and humanity of Jesus, Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit, the universal church, the life everlasting. Instead, we need to let go of things that don't have eternal significance. Consider your church. What reorienting step are you willing to take to move into God's new thing? Where are you stuck and what do you need to release? How are you as a congregation making new friends beyond your church in the broader community? How are you peace building personally and as a church? Looking at your statistics over the last 10 years, what is one step your congregation can take to be healthy and thrive? One step. What about this? What if we stop praying for God to come be with us and instead ask, God, where are you working to relieve suffering and injustice? Give us courage to join you. That one step in how we pray moves us to listen deeply and pay attention to how God is transforming the world. Our North Carolina Annual Conference mission is simple. Healthy churches and effective leaders in every place making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And our focus centers this work, disciple making, leader forming, and peace building. My prayer for your charge conference is you name your current reality and you take a step toward the new thing God is stirring among you. May the Holy Spirit energize your time together now. Amen. Well, I don't, I don't know if I need to share a sermon with y'all because Bishop <laughs> Connie is preaching to us. <laughs> I want to make sure there's there's no young disciples who are here right now. I kind of skipped over that because I did not see any. Okay, just making sure. Um, I didn't want to exclude anybody. Um, I'll just put that in my back pocket for next week, you know. <laughs> but this Sunday, we're going to be in Micah, um, one of our Old Testament prophets. Um, and I'll just read it for us. I hope this is a word that we need to hear this morning um, for this season that we find ourselves in. Um, Hear the words of the Lord. Micah 6, verse 1. Hear what the Lord is saying. Arise. Lay out the lawsuit before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, mountains, the lawsuit of the Lord. Hear, eternal foundations of the earth. The Lord has a lawsuit against God's people. With Israel, God will argue. My people, what did I ever do to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of slavery. I sent Moses and Aaron and Miriam before you. My people remember what Moab's king Balak had planned and how Balaam, Beor's son, answered him. Remember everything from Shittim to Gilgal that you might learn to recognize the righteous acts of the Lord. What does the Lord require? 
With what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with entirely burned offerings with year-old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams with many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crime, the fruit of my body for the sin of my spirit? Well, he's, he's told you, human one, of what is good and what the Lord requires from you. So do justice, to embrace faithful love and to walk humbly with your God. It's the word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's a little context for us, for this Micah prophet. Um, Micah is living during the time when um, the Assyrian Empire is starting to send the Northern Kingdom of Israel into exile during this kind of war time um, where Assyria is coming in and conquering. And we know that Judah kind of made a pact with Assyria, the Assyrian Empire and said, we'll help you if you'll help us. And they became a vassal state for them. And this is where Micah is living during that time. There's a lot of conflict going on. There's a lot of hurt between the Israelite nation of the north and Judah of the south. And we see in Micah's prophet here, his story here, um, that he often, instead of calling the southern kingdom Judah, you know, Israel of the north and Judah of the south, he instead calls Judah Israel. He says, you are Israel. We are all Israel, not trying to divide, you know, those political and social differences between the north and the south, but instead trying to invite to understand that we're all in this together. The loss of that northern kingdom is our loss as well. He wanted to show that we're united by our father Abraham, by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who was named Israel with Moses, with Joshua, crossing over the Jordan. We have all experienced this. That's our history, and we all are living it together. Now, Micah is from a small town, a rural town called, let me see if I can say this right, Morisheth Gath. Everybody know that small town, right? <laughs> Famous biblical town, right? No, it's, it's kind of a town that's kind of out in a rural place, small town, and this is where he grew up. It's located southeast of Jerusalem. And, he's, and, and Micah's talking during a time where he saw injustice in these places that were small and secluded, away from the power of this big city of Jerusalem. And he saw how during tumultuous times, during difficult times, it was often not the, the big city of Jerusalem that was hit hardest, but the small towns around it, those who were just trying to get by small communities who were just trying to support each other. And he saw that it wasn't the, the rich and the high priests and the religious leaders and the kings who were suffering during seasons of war, but the poor and those who were just regular, ordinary people. And he saw that religious ceremonies and religious rituals that were happening in Jerusalem to the T, they didn't feed the hungry. That the sick weren't made well that the downcast of society weren't lifted up, that God was found in each human being, not in the ritualistic practice that ignored what was happening around these people. And this prophecy is thought to be written towards those who are in Jerusalem, for its people, for those religious elite people to look around. Micah actually claims that Jerusalem itself will likely fall if they keep going down this path of injustice that it has done. We see how in this scene in Micah in chapter six, that God is at court with Israel. God has kind of pulled them up and said, I'm gonna hold you to account for what has happened, the injustice that's happening in your land with your people. That they haven't lived up to the expectation that God has placed them in, that the covenant that God has made is only being held up by God and not by Israel.
God is making a case. And that the hills and the valleys, the mountains, will be the witness to see what has been done. Because if we think about the ground where we stand on, or the trees that are around us, or the hills and the mountains, they've seen all of it. What better account than those that we stand on? And so God pulls them in and says, what have you seen? This failure. And so it wasn't Jerusalem that served justice to these ordinary people out in these small towns. It wasn't the powerful who took care of the regular person, of the the neighbor next door. All Jerusalem was focused on these sacrificial ceremonies, these rituals, and getting them just right and following all of Moses' law to the T, all 600-some laws. While that was the focus, the ordinary people weren't being served. There was something missing here. It wasn't Jerusalem who was helping those out who were in need. It was their neighbors in those small towns. It was those small communities that had to hold each other up, to stand up for the marginalized widow on the street, maybe giving extra crop to the hungry family down the street or mentoring each other, teaching each other how we can do this together, how we can create good relationships with God and each other. We shared honest feelings about how do we learn to live together during these tumultuous times, during these periods of war. Because if they couldn't figure that out, if they were not able to bond together during those times and support each other, their their culture and their society, their relationships in this town would be gone. War and famine would sweep through and leave them empty and gone. And Micah is trying to help us understand that he saw God the most in those relationships that were made, where people were like Christ in serving each other in humility and faith. Because earthly powers will will always have to compromise in some way with trying to honor God's covenant. Jerusalem's not gonna be able to save everybody. Because it's got its own problems. There's no human system or human rulers that can fully live into God's glory because governments, religious leaders, leaders of any sort over people who have dominion, who have domination, who have power through law, military, and other forms of rule. There's no way with that kind of power we can let God fully rule in our lives when we're seeking to rule other people. That's why we see Jesus. We never see him running for public office, do we? right? (laughs) He's not going for those high positions in the government or becoming a soldier and coming up the ranks and trying to change the system from the inside out. No, because he knew that God could not be installed in a human system, that cannot be fully lived out in a human system. We do our best as Christians when we get into those positions to be that person, but no person nor no party will ever get it right. There's no sacrificial ritual, there's no sacrificial ceremony that can make things right in our world. No amount of getting it perfect is going to get our world perfect. The only thing we can do is to seek to do what God has called us to do in all that we do, which Micah summed it up in three ways to do justice, to do justice. God has called us to be just in the world, to see when things are wrong and people are oppressed and hurting, that we have the courage to stand up and say something. That when we see somebody saying something that shouldn't be said about someone else, that we say something about it. Or when somebody is thrown in a place where it's not humane to be thrown, we say something about it. We don't stand idly by, but we speak out. 
The second thing Micah says is to embrace faithful love or love kindness or love mercy. For us, we have to be different from the world. We have to be different from those forces that seek to oppose what God is trying to do. We have to show something radically inclusive and loving. To look at each individual human being and see the self-worth that is inside them. To see that God has planted God's self in those people and said, you are very good. You were made in my image. For us, we can do that with enemy we can do that with stranger because we know who we are in God. The last thing is to, to walk humbly or wisely, carefully with our God. It's an interesting translation. We always go to humbly, um, but it's interesting. It can also mean kind of this very careful about how we step with God. If God has laid out this path, we don't want to step off of it. But when we walk with God, we want to walk beside God, with God, around God. And so every step we take when we are called by God to do something, we do it with intentionality. We don't just rush into it. We walk through it, figuring it out together. Kind of reminds me of some general rules. Does anybody know anything about some general rules in our church? Right? John and Charles, or John Wesley kind of sent over to America, some, some of the church with these kind of rules for the church of something we should always do. He says to, to do no harm, to do good, and to stay in love with God, to attend to the ordinances of God. And I see that, to do justice, to do no harm, to embrace faithful love, to do good, to walk humbly with God, to love God. It's the same call for all of us as Methodists to live these things out, to be a true neighbor to somebody else where we are in the community that we reside in right now. Micah saw that the, the big city of Jerusalem needed some more of that community found in those small places. The love that is between such people who support each other, to not seek to, to dominate others, but to serve them with no agenda, but God's heart of justice, loving kindness, and walking with others through life. That that is where God's covenant with humanity is lived out each day. That is where God has found the most, in the connection that we make between each other. This does not necessarily happen for us in the White House or in the Capitol building as much as those decisions affect the daily lives of each other. It is our responsibility as the church to be the community who makes God's heart known to those around us with those three things, justice, kindness, and wisely walking with God. That's it for Micah. All the rituals, all the ceremonies, all the traditions are helpful parts of God's covenant. They help us to see and be with God, but when they become the sole purpose of our community and being together, we miss what God is doing between each other. We miss what God is trying to accomplish. We miss so much when we decide to make them our idol as something that should divide us in order to save my tradition and my rule and my authority and my way of being. It's when we can actually give those things up and look around that we begin to notice that there's a widow in need, that the farmer is sick, that the family is suffering from loss, that a husband is extremely depressed, that a woman is just tired of it all. The people who walk around us, we can see them. When we finally just drop the act of ritual and ceremony, which is the image of looking holy. In order to seek relationship that is actually holy. It's so easy for us to put up the front to make sure everything looks just right, rather than to live out what is right and just. And so we come to this final Sunday for us. 
talking about this unique place that we as the church are in during a political season. For people of all different beliefs, politics, and traditions voluntarily come together and make a unique shade of purple that only we as the church can make. And it is in this gathering that we are challenged to be holy, to be different from the chaos of the world and society around us, to not give into the hateful dialogue, to not give into the dividing of humanity against each other or the weaponization of holy words or seeking to have those mic drop moments or disparaging others or the building up of walls between us. That we as a church offer a way in the wilderness, centered in Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life. We see how Jesus made an impact on the world, and that's by serving the community that he was in. It wasn't focused on priestly politics as much as Pharisees and scribes tried to make it about that, but seeking the truth together, asking questions, embracing the awkwardness of what we're trying to do, and seeking to understand each other. Jesus sought to live in peace without ever casting a stone. Jesus shows us that, that peace comes through living out justice, faithful love, and wisely walking with God. It's only when we can embrace these three that Micah names that the God of peace is able to shine through the church, that we can make an impact for God's kingdom, a kingdom that seeks a place with no more pain, no more tears, no more evil, a place where everyone stands on holy ground and everyone is of sacred worth, a church that expands thousands of miles into the sky and we bring all people in that they all have a place at the table. That we are here together as God's children and that connection between each of us transcends the places where we stand and we find common ground together at the cross of suffering. And so on this Sunday, a week and a half before the final election day, I want to remind you to live as instruments of peace during this time. And then no matter what happens or who is elected to different positions in our government in the United States, in our state, in our community, in our town, Each will have an impact on us in some way. But no matter what, even when those people take those positions and make those laws, we will still be here. We will still be here. And we'll be here in community together. This will be a place of respite for you. This will be a place of rejuvenation, I hope for you, so that you may shine light into darkened times. And you may be peace for somebody who's entrenched in violent conflict. That you may be genuine and fleshed in your heart for someone as they have built up callous stone walls around their heart. That's my hope in this season, that you would have the maturity of Christ in all that you say, in all that you think, and in all that you would do. That's my prayer for all of us in this season. I want, to, I want us to take a moment to look in your bulletin. Um, we have our connection card there. No, I always look over these and I'll always pray for the things. Or if you just need me to contact you, let me know. I'd be happy to do that. Um, but there's also another thing in there. Um, it's this little card right here. Um, this is a, a, a peace on purpose pledge. Um, and I wanted to give you all the opportunity after we've gone through this kind of talking about our role as a church during a political season for the past six weeks. I wanted you to, to have this as a way to remind yourself of what we talked about the past six weeks and to remind us how to live that out. And so I wanna give y'all a moment to read it over, to, to look at it, and you can initial your name on those things that you feel called to do and sign your name at the bottom. You won't turn these in. This is something for you to keep and make that pledge between yourself and God.
This is a reminder for us. And so we'll read through those in a little bit. On the back, I have a couple resources for you all. Um, first is a QR code for our social principles in the United Methodist Church. I have not read through this year's 2024 General Conference social principles, but I, I've read the 2016 one before. But it is a resource that shows us as the United Methodist Church what we believe on social issues and social topics. It could be climate change, it could be food injustice, it could be poverty, gambling, reproductive health, substance abuse, gender equality, everything. There, it, it is almost all there. It is 40 pages long. Whew, yeah, not a light reading. But I think it gives us some perspective on some of the issues that are happening in this world and how the United Methodist Church falls and where we fall. You may not, dis you may not agree with some of them, or you may be like, oh, that's a great way to think about it, or I don't think they went far enough. But I think it lays the foundation for us to have these conversations to talk about these things. I think that's very reasonable. When I read through the 2016 one, I was like, yeah, I think that's great. Something to be proud of, I think, for our church that we have this. Second thing is the Church of the Resurrection started a campaign for kindness during this political season. And it has a bunch of resources on there for how to actually live that out. How do we practically show kindness in a political season? Um, and how do we love people through it? Um, so there's a QR code there for that. Um, but the kind of emphasis is do unto others as they would, you would have them do unto you. Um, and just that reminder. But I want us to take some time. Jeff's gonna play a little bit of music for us to look at this card, fill it out, um, or if you need to fill it out at home, feel free to. And just think about it, pray over it, and take it home with you and think more on it. Cool? Cool. Let us pray. God of peace, we invite you to be with us today as we know you are in our community. God, help us to live as peacemakers. For we are called children of God. May we be your instruments in this world to bring about justice, to embrace faithful love, to walk humbly with you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen.
invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together. Lord, whose love through humble service. invite you to turn to 556 in your hypno for this litany for Christian unity. Let us ask the Lord to strengthen in all Christians faith in Christ, the Savior of the world. Listen to us, O Lord. Let us ask the Lord to sustain and guide Christians with his gifts along the way to full unity. Listen to us, O Lord. Let us ask the Lord for the gift of unity and peace for the world. Listen to us, O Lord. Would you pray with me? We ask you, O oh Lord, for the gifts of your spirit, enable us to penetrate the depth of the whole truth and grant that we may share with others the goods you have put out at our disposal. Teach us to overcome divisions, send us your spirit to lead to full unity, your sons and daughters and full charity in obedience to your will, to Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We are going to share our joys and concerns this Sunday. Um, we have a, a microphone available for y'all um, that we will bring around. Um, and if you have any ways that we can pray for you, please feel free to share those things. Or if you have any joys of the way God, God has shown up in your life, we would love to hear those things too. 
Um, and so if you want to share those things, Gary's going to come around with the microphone and, and he is going to give you the opportunity to do that. So everybody online too can hear us too. So um, if you have anything, just raise a hand um, and Gary will come and, and meet you where you're at. Yeah, Kim. It looks like the Apple drop is going to happen on November 9th. We're going to need people to help um, direct parking, bag, potato, sweet potatoes. I mean, apples. That thing, yeah. <laughs> I'm a sweet things. potato mode right now. Um, uh, so anybody who's, who can help on that day, um, it, it'll be in the Lions Club front yard. Um, starting early in the morning, just come and help out whenever you can during the day. It'll be an all day affair. So, and get, pick up some free apples and tell your friends. And Kim, th th those are local farmers who bring produce so that it doesn't get- No, uh, um, this, these apples come from West Virginia. Okay. The, the farmers produce more apples uh, that, um, that if they put them all on the market, it would depress the price too much. And so the government of West Virginia is subsidizing the, the farmers, um, giving them, uh, I guess, government aid to distribute the apples so they don't just rot on the ground or on the trees. Um, and they, they send them out to anybody who can distribute them to people who want apples. Um, so if you have an agency that would like some, tell them about it. They can come pick up as many apples as they want. It'll be a truckload, like 40,000 pounds of apples. So we need lots of help. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. They're free. They're and free. Early is, uh, uh, well, last year uh, the truck came at 5 o'clock in the morning, um, but we'd have to unload the truck. So probably come like 8 o'clock. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim. Anyone else? Yeah, Gary. Yes, let us remember some of our shut-ins. Um, Joyce Bumpus, Ruth Campbell, Nancy Burns, and Chuck Weiler, Henry Garrett. Also, I saw Virginia this week. She is improving each day. Um, and tomorrow she will be moved to Hillcrest. Let us remember these in our prayers. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, Mary. I hope everybody's seen God's beauty in all the trees. I've enjoyed looking at the leaves as they change color. And I wanted to give a report on my daughter, Amy. She uh, has liver cancer and the doc, the kind she has is supposed to be somewhere else, supposed to have originated somewhere else. And so she had the PT scan and didn't show anything else. So my prayer is that she's not, the doctor is not, it's not going to be anywhere. The doctor keeps looking, but my, if you'll pray that it's not anywhere else and we can take care of the liver. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Anyone else have any joys or concerns they'd like to share this morning? <clears throat> yeah, thank you all so much for sharing those things. Let's pray. God of all things, you are with us in all seasons of life. We see the goodness of your love through the seasons. We thank you so much for your creation and that we get to enjoy it and be a part of it. Help us, God, to support those who are suffering right now, to be a presence of love, peace, and joy for them. God, help us and help those we've named today, and those who are on our hearts. We pray for Christ to help them in whatever ways are right. Help us to be like Christ. We remember these words that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us take time now to look back at our weeks 
What's been going on for us? Who have we seen? Who have we interacted with? What ways have we interacted well with others? And what ways haven't we interacted well? All of us have fallen short of God's glory and our expectations for us. We come here for forgiveness and love with each other to try and right those wrongs and to seek Christ's way in all that we do. So take a moment and confess those things to God. Talk about the week. Reflect on yourself. Let us pray in silence. Would you pray this prayer with me? Loving God, you inspire us with love for all persons and concern for the well being of all creation. Give us today the strength and courage to transform the compassion of our hearts into acts of peace, mercy, and justice. Forgive us for the arrogance that leads to moral blindness for desires for vengeance and retaliation, and for willingness to sacrifice others for our own security and greed. Help us to renounce all forms of violence, prejudice, unfair allegations, intolerance, and injury. Empower us to live out the caring presence of the merciful and generous persons we claim to be. Make us channels of your peace, bearers of healing for justice in our world. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, who came to show us the way. Amen. Hear the good news this morning that while we were yet sinners, while we have hurt others, while we have done harm, Christ died for us and forgives us. In the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite y'all to pass the peace after the service. Please do it well. I know y'all actually do it really good, so I don't even have to get on y'all about that. But please feel free to share in fellowship after the service this Sunday. Um, I want to invite us into a time of thinking about all that God has given us. Think about this week, the food that you, this been, has gone in your bellies, the clothes that are on your back the transportation that you've had from place to place, the family, the friends that you have, God has given all those to us as a gift. And so we are called to be generous people. We are called to be generous in many ways with our gifts, with our talents, with our treasures. And so this morning, if you feel called to, to give to what Bethany is doing, if you're led by the spirit to do that, we invite that at this point. So I wanna invite our ushers forward to receive these morning tithes, offerings, and gifts.
God, we thank you so much for these gifts and those who have given. Help us to be generous in all that we do, and may these gifts bless those you've called to be blessed. And may we be your hands, feet, heart, and head in all that we do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let us sing together, Come Thou Fount. for you all church conference is at three o'clock and it's going to be here in the sanctuary if you all are coming everyone's invited to be at it and then participate in it but hear this benediction this morning that you would go from this place to be peace for the world as our world needs the peace of god to abide in their lives just as it abides in us may you be that peace to people whose hearts have turned to stone in defense that you may be vulnerable unto them that you would do justice you'd embrace faithful love and you'd walk wisely humbly with your God. Go in peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.